Welcome to Network and Chill on the Couch. We're going to be hosting a series of talks with investors, entrepreneurs, and startups who will be giving us a little bit of advice, some top tips, and an insight into their personal journey. So joining us today on the Network and Chill Couch, we have William. So tell us a bit about yourself. Hey, so I'm William. I'm the founder of a company called the Academy of Robotics. And I'm excited to be here. Nice. Tell us a little bit about Academy of Robotics and maybe about yourself, how you got started. Academy of Robotics is all about automating the last mile of delivery. So what this means is that we take a car or we build a car and make it drive itself to your house to perform package delivery. So the end goal is that if you buy something online, a robot car will deliver it to your house, ideally in less than 20 minutes. Nice. Okay, so where do you see the company in about five years? Our end goal is that we're hoping to disrupt the last mile delivery space. Um, we are trying to build a platform in which if anyone, anywhere buys anything online, our autonomous solution is the ideal one to use because it's so much cheap and so much, so much cheaper and so much quicker. So my entrepreneur journey actually started maybe 11 years ago where I made a 20 year plan. And the 20 year plan was that I wanted to build certain startups and each one would be more complicated than the last. So my first startup was actually at 19 years old. It was a company called 123 Registration, which was later acquired. A few years later, I then did a new startup, which I took to BBC's Dragon's Den. Um, the dragons hated it, <laughs> but um, the world didn't. It was licensed to be in 11 countries. After that one, I did another startup, which was then eventually acquired by Secret Escapes. So let me ask you, when Dragon's Den told you they hated the idea, did that make you lose any motivation? You know, how do you then get going or stay motivated when a massive platform like that kind of tells you they don't believe in the idea? Um, so What's interesting is, um, for me, I always saw Dragon's Den as an experience to get our name out there because there was a major advantage that I was probably on the biggest BBC platform at the time, which meant all my potential customers who understood the problem would get it. So I suppose as an entrepreneur, if you have absolute conviction in what you're doing, um, you're kind of irrationally biased to always support it no matter what. So it doesn't matter if they all, every investor stood and said it's not going to be done but you don't get the problem because I was obsessed with it, right? Yeah. Which, which I suppose is a good entrepreneur trait. So for me, it was actually a very positive experience. Um, everybody now knew we existed and it's probably what kick-started our journey. So I was quite happy with that. So you think maybe that no helped you to the yes you finally got? Pro probably. I mean, so every no is a step closer to a yes, right? Because you're going to learn something from it, adjust slightly and then to your next pitch, you're that little bit better and that little bit better. So yeah, and I think um, Dragon's Den as a platform is great because it beat me into shape in terms of due diligence and understanding how to structure these things mm -hmm. because BBC will not let you on there unless they have checked have, every yeah. fact. And so it taught me very early on that these things matter, how to structure them. And yeah, it was an important learning experience. Nice. So Richard Branson, he says that everyone, everyone can be an entrepreneur. How true do you think that is? Everyone could be an entrepreneur, but, but I'll tell you what I will say on that. There are certain people today who are better at being nurses because they are so much more compassionate. Um, and there's other people who have a personality type that's better as a lawyer because they're structured and they're logical, right? So... Most people would agree that there's certain personality types which are best suited for certain types of careers. And being an entrepreneur, 
in my view, there's a personality type for that too, which means, yeah, sure, anyone can attempt to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> but it's a hard game where certain people just do better at it because it's very, very stressful. But we lo I love it, you know, and all my entrepreneur colleagues, they love that email saying it's all going to shut down, fix it. And they'll fix it by the end of the day and they somehow feel fulfilled. So I would say maybe not everybody's built for it, but everyone can attempt, everyone can try something. <laughs> So what would you say a day in the life of William looks like? Like I've noticed you, you're wearing, is this your logo? Do you live and breathe Academy of Robotics? Yes. So yes, Do you this, this imprint is a, it uh, everywhere? Yes, sorry. yes, so this is a custom lapel pin. Um, it is actually our company logo, which represents transcendence. It's where the next stage of evolution, where humans become part machine, part human. As you can tell, I'm a futuristic technologist. Mm -hmm. My day often starts the night before. What this means is around 10 o'clock the night before, I look at my emails, look at the past appointments in my diary, and then I plan what I'm going to do the morning after, the afternoon after, the evening after. My emails are only checked twice a day. If someone misses that 10 o'clock cutoff, that is not going to be checked until four. The reason I do this is it's just time management. Otherwise, it's so easy these days to be a slave to your email because everything's urgent. Everything's gonna, what needs to happen now? Do you know what? It could wait. Um, so I pre-plan the night before, which actually follows another larger narrative set on the Sunday before for the week. So it's plans within plans, all following a preset narrative. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's important to stick to that because I think I have the same view as you have in time management and a balance. I think some people think it's constantly work, work, work. And then some people just like, no, there's more structure to when you look at certain emails, when you respond to certain things. So another question I have is, what's your balance like with your work life and your personal life? Do you, are you all the time thinking about Academy and Robotics and what you need to do? Or do you balance a personal life? Do you spend time with your friends and family doing your hobbies? Like, what does that look like? I think it's important for entrepreneurs and people who have just got startups to kind of know how much time they should be investing into, you know. Sure. Yeah, to see what I'm saying. Yeah, so for me, it's, it's an interesting one, right? So I come from an event background. Um, and so there's two things I do which are completely unrelated to robots or robotics. So the first is that I, for fun, have an expensive hobby throwing London's biggest rave. It's an event, it's a legal rave, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's an event called Planet Angel. A team of excellent people and I are put on this happy hippie event with indoor skating, bouncing castles, and we all just have fun. Um, huge following, um, you can find it on Facebook if you like. Um, and that's what I do. I go to experiential events every now and again for a dash of chaos. Nice. So that's, that's one of your expensive hobbies. Yeah. And what's one of your less expensive hobbies? There isn't any work. <laughs> <laughs> work. So that's your balance. Yeah. Okay. I, I suppose, yeah. So it's going to experiential events, something that is so different to my usual structured, logical. Because remember, my, my day job involves a lot of artificial intelligence. Half our team is a PhD doctor in some weird abstract of computer science and this is my world as well because my degree is in artificial intelligence and robotics or well, that's what i studied at least so yeah it can be quite intellectual and quite intense this is why for me a dash of chaos and going to some crazy party in scala or the islington metalworks is, is something i do nice so tell us about your university experience so um, I actually went to university as a mature student. So about three years ago, my last startup got acquired by Secret Escapes. And I thought I could A, sail off into the sunset and go on a never ending holiday. Um, B, I could start another startup. Um, and option B seemed better for me um, because I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, true and true. And I thought the next startup I should do should really solve a big problem because okay. the world doesn't need a faster or better way to book a restaurant. At least I don't think it does. Um, so I decided to go back to study and I went to Aberystwyth University in Wales where I studied artificial intelligence and robotics as a mature student. 
This was specifically so that I could innovate in the robotics and artificial intelligence space. So before you went to university, did you have the idea of Academy of Robotics or was it when you were at university studying, that's where the idea came about? Interesting. So I always knew that I wanted to disrupt last mile delivery. And I originally thought that I could do this with drones. So what I did is I actually filed a patent first, which was for an invisible road network in the sky, which drones would use to navigate from point A to point B. But I figured that my geek credentials weren't enough to be able to build such a startup or lead a tech team to build a startup. So I thought I'll up the geek credentials by studying AI and robotics. So when I went there, um, as I studied and learned more, it made sense that drones may not be the solution. The solution is probably going to be in cars. It was there that I met our lead scientist, who was actually one of the lecturers, or Americans call them professors there, and our lead engineer, who was one of the PhD students, Ishan, who is with us today. So it became a reality whilst I was at university because I had a better understanding of what was possible and what wasn't. But yeah, I knew nothing of the industry when I went there. I mean, I was just a bit of a geek um, and I, I acquired the skill to be able to build a startup. So you've gone to university, you've met your future part, your business partners, I assume, or people who are now on your team. So I would assume that you are always networking, you're, you know, you're meeting people. And do you think it's important for, you know, budding entrepreneurs or people who have startup companies to put themselves in environments that can allow them to meet people that will benefit them. Absolutely, it's important to network, which is why I quite like Network and Chill. You are as valuable as your context in this game. To put this into context, I currently have 267 investors in the Academy of Robotics. And 267 investors, you'd need some networking skills to do that, right? Um, had I not been a networker to the core, I don't think I'd be able to fund this company. Um, so yes, contact networks are very important. They will open doors for you. They're the ones who will introduce you to the right investor. So it's all about people. And on the topic of investors, I think they say don't just accept investment from anyone or anywhere. It, you know, do you have any ad advice? You know, I think at some stages you've declined investment from you know, big companies. Um, so do you have a bit of advice on what you should be looking for at certain times of your business? Yes, absolutely. I believe which investors you choose matters. And it's important to not get sidetracked with investor narratives because believe it or not, everyone has, a, has their own agenda, be they an investor or a, a partner company. So some firms invest for profit, some invest for prestige, some invest for, for whatever reason, right? And some firm might invest because they want to attach their brand to yours and then maybe shift you to making not that widget, but this other type of widget because it's going to be better for their business, right? Um, and so you need to identify, is this investment going to come at a cost? The cost being, is it going to steer us away from our narrative? So for instance, one of the larger tech companies approached us with, it seemed a good offer, but they wanted us to change our core technology. Their way was inferior. It still would have worked, but it was inferior. And we ended up saying no to the check from them because A, to dilute all our existing investors, B, it would, um, it would also divert us. And so in a company like mine with 267 investors, I need to remember that I have some venture capital, I have some business angels and some friends and family. They all want different things. Friends and family just want to support you, so they're fine. Um, angel investors want you to sell for 10, 20 million. Venture capital don't want you to sell at 20 million. They want to sell at 100 million or a billion. So you can't do an exit prematurely because you'd upset half your investors. But then you can if you structure the right sort of deal where maybe you use shares from or venture capital money to buy out the prior shareholders but then you buy them cheaper at maybe 2x what they paid, but then you attach that to the valuation of the next round, so it's, it's a win-win deal, right? So there's all sorts of things you need to be aware of when you're doing your investment rounds, taking new money, as to how will it affect first my initial investors, 
is it the right money? Is it going to distract us? Because it's so easy to, I'll take the money, take the money, and then you end up not doing what you want to do initially because you're a prestige pitch from some other company to say, hey, look at our eco-credentials. We invest in this company because their PR value in investing you outweighs them paying for a PR company to, to perhaps uh, run a, a marketing campaign. So the right money is very important and it's very easy to get sidetracked or to be, to be trapped into accepting the first check that comes in. So what would you say, f- you know, what ad- advice would you give for budding entrepreneurs? What, what would you say to them? Just do it. Um, don't think about it, just do it. Because it's very likely that an entrepreneur's first startup is not going to be their last startup, right? And there's no penalty for failure. What I mean by that is you might start something and lose a bunch of money, but you know what? You've learned what to do and what not to do. So what have you lost then? You've gained them. So there's no penalty for failure. Try it, learn, try it again, learn. Try it a third time and you'd be surprised that you probably know exactly who to call, what to say, how to do it. So long as you're learning, you'll do well. Mm -hmm. So I want to touch on friends and family. Um, What were your parents like? when you said to them, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to start my own business. I think a lot of parents, when they hear their child wants to start their own company or something like that, they're like, no, you need to be a lawyer or a doctor or a nine to five job, because I think it it scares a lot of of parents when their child wants, there's a lot of risks with starting your own business and stuff. So how are your parents in supporting you during I mean, they must be used to it now, Yes, <laughs> since this is not your first company, For but sure. I'm sure when you first started, how was that conversation? So I'd say they're very supportive in that they do let me run away with the crazy new idea because they've seen the results. I think I've earned that over time, <laughs> that, that, no. That credibility, was, yeah, the, I've got a new idea and I'm going to pursue it. For sure, I'm, but I think they always knew because when I was 16, um, I started fixing computers and getting paid, and I would get paid a lot. So much so, I would earn more money at 16 than the average person on minimum wage whilst I was in school, because I'd charge a premium at a 50% discount. Um, and computers at the time, they were new, nobody got them, and here's some kid who says he could do the same thing some tech companies charging thousands for, which was true, I could do it, because it was just a, compu- just a computer. I mean. The skills taken for granted that anyone can fix a computer now, but at the time it was seen as a dark art that no one can do. So the parents had already seen from a young age, yeah, this one, he's into business and stuff. So when I said I'm actually starting a business. They were like, no, (laughs) you're just doing this at home. (laughs) I'd I'd say they're quite proud actually, um, because it it was, you know, our parents can always tell, right? They they, they could tell and I think they just saw it was going to happen and they let me do it. in fact, they knew, they knew that they probably wouldn't be able to stop me anyway. So, yeah. Oh, um, and I was lucky enough that um, I met some good people along the way. And, you know, an entrepreneur is the team around them, right? So, met some good people. And I was lucky and I had a couple of acquisitions. So, I'll say watch the space. We will, definitely. And I've really enjoyed catching up with you today and learning about Academy of Robotics and a little bit about you. So, I'm excited to catch up with you in the near future. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.